Father. Good morning, everyone. Good, good morning, everyone. It's so, it's so funny to see the difference with everyone when there's not a countdown on the, the, the screens. It's nice to have the chatter that you have to cut in on. It feels more normal. <laughs> so anyway, good morning, everyone. It's lovely to have you all here, whether you're in person, in the building, or whether you're at home. I hope that the Spirit of God just really blesses you this morning. Um, we're going to move into a, a worship song, um, but I just want to say a quick prayer. So let's pray. Loving Father, we just come now and move into your presence. We ask that your spirit moves in this place and wherever we are this morning. Bless us in your name. Amen. Let's sing. Let's stand together. We're coming to our almighty God, the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, one God. Let's worship him. In the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, in the name of the Spirit, Lord, we come. We're gathered together to lift up your name, to call on our Savior, to fall on your grace. Hear the joyful sound of our offering As your saints bow down, as your people sing We will rise with you lifted on your wings And the world will see that Our God saves Our God saves In the name of the Spirit, Lord, we come. We're gathered together to lift up your name, to call on the Savior, to fall on your grace. Hear the joyful sound of our offering as your saints bow down, as your people sing. We will rise with you on your wings and the world will see that our God saves our God saves there is hope in your name and morning turns Songs of praise, yes, our God saves, our God saves, yeah. Hear the joyful sound, hear the joyful sound of a as your saints bow down, as your people sing, we will rise with you lifted on your wings, and the world will see thy hear the joyful sound, hear the joyful sound of our offering. As your saints bow down, as your people sing, we will rise with you lifted on your wings. And the world will see that our God saves, our God saves, there is hope in Jesus' name, and morning turns. 
to songs of praise. Our God saves. Our God saves. Our God Loving God, creator of the ends of the earth, source of all it that is and has been and will be, giver of life, we join together to worship you. We praise you for the wonder of our world, for the creation that you have given us around, all around us, to enjoy and to look on the beauty of the rivers, the valleys, the mountains, our parks, our car parks. We thank you that we can meet you in these places. Loving God, we join together to worship you. We thank you for everything that lifts our spirits, that moves us to wonder, that holds our attention, and that captures our interest. Whatever that might be for each of us, whether it's the laughter or chatter of a child, the noise of our friends in our living room, our families over a dinner table, or the silence in our room. Lord, we join together to worship you. We rejoice that out of chaos you brought order, an order that we can see throughout the universe, which we can depend upon, explore and understand, an order that reflects your sovereign purpose and reveals your guiding hand. Loving God, we join together to worship you. Loving God, creator of life and all its fullness, we bring you our praise this morning and we offer you our deepest worship. We make our response in joyful celebration and we join together to worship you in the name of Jesus Christ. And let us say together the words that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be your name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. I'd like to hand over to Angie, who's going to do the notices. Not too many notices this morning, but as a family, there's always things to celebrate. And this morning, we'd like to congratulate David Wilson on becoming a grandfather. Woo! So, congratulations, David. His little granddaughter is called Winter Rose. Isn't that a beautiful Aww. name? So we just bless her and we rejoice with you in this, the birth of this new child. Um, no, uh, the, the cafe, after being closed for 18 months, and it's been a long 18 months, is reopening on the 22nd of this month. Um, if you think you can help there, if you can help volunteer even for a few hours, I would be delighted to hear from you. There's also an advert at the moment out for a job position for cafe manager and volunteer manager. Is God speaking to you? Do you hear God speaking to you about that position? If you do, please fill in that application. Um, evening services, they've started again. They started last week and once again there'll be an evening service tonight at 6.30. 
So you're very welcome to come along. It'll be a bit more informal. And we're just being led by God. So, Nikki, <laughs> you've been with us for a year now. Yes. Since last September. And you came in at a very difficult time when it was very difficult to connect with the congregation and do what you've been called to do. But I'm sure everybody will agree that she's done an amazing job. I've been so, so, yeah, great, give her up. I've been so blessed by her teaching, by her preaching, and she just brings a different perspective to things, and it's really blessed me. So Nikki's going to give us a wee update on what's been happening to her and what the next step for her is. Um, so I had my, my final review for probation, um, which I got through okay. Well, um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the only thing that they had to hang off for just before I got all my certification was to, uh, just to get my law essay done, because um, I didn't enjoy that so much, um, but I did pass. <laughs> so that's me. I'm um, ready to, to move forward now for ordination. Um, the The... Presbytery has a plan, <laughs> um, and the, the, they're meeting on Tuesday night just to confirm it all, um, uh, to propose me going forward for ordination. So I would love your prayers for that for, for Tuesday. There's no reason that it, nothing should uh, sort of hold that up, but just your prayers would be appreciated. Because mm -hmm. um, if that gets approved, then um, the next thing is to um, just finalise if I'm going to be going to St Nicholas's down in Sight Hill. Um, where I'll be working with Tom down there. So um, that's, that's quite exciting. I had a, a meeting with Tom just before my, my review meeting um, and it's quite exciting sort of what, what I can go in and, and help sort of just get involved with and yeah, just see where God, God takes us. So. Mm. That is really exciting because through Food Bank we've had quite a lot of contact with, with Tom and when I heard that Nikki was going there, I thought, oh, wow, what is God doing? Mm. This could be really exciting. So could we pray for you? Yeah. Just stretch out your hands. Lord, I thank you for Nikki. I thank you for the many, many gifts that you've given her. And just that anointing to speak your words and to teach. We thank you for her heart, her heart for so many different people, Lord, people groups. And we bless her in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord, that you have called her to this area, which is so exciting. Thank you that she's going to be working with Tom and that there will be links, I'm sure, with Holy Trinity. So we just bless you, Nikki, and we pray that everything would go smoothly with regards to your ordination as it goes to presbytery and so on. So thank you, Lord, for Nikki, and bless her exceedingly abundantly above with every blessing. Thank you that when you call, you equip, and Nikki is fully equipped for all you've called her to. Amen. Amen. Thanks. So we're going to turn to God's word now. The passage from this morning is just continuing on in the series that we've been doing. So we're in Hebrews 3. And so, dear brothers and sisters who belong to God and are partners with those called to heaven, think carefully about this Jesus, whom we declare to be God's messenger and high priest. For he was faithful to God who appointed him, just as Moses served faithfully when he was entrusted with God's entire house. But Jesus deserves far more glory than Moses, just as a person who builds a house deserves more praise than the, than the house itself. For every house has a builder, but the one who built everything is God. Moses was certainly faithful in God's house as a servant. His work was an illustration of the truths God would reveal later. But Christ, as the Son, is in charge of God's entire house, and we are God's house if we keep our courage and remain confident in, the hope in, Christ, in, in our hope in Christ. That is why the Holy Spirit says, 
Today, when you hear his voice, don't harden your hearts, as Israel did when they rebelled, when they tested me in the wilderness. There, your ancestors tested and tried my patience, even though they saw my miracles for 40 years. So I was angry with them, and I said, their hearts always turn away from me. They refuse to do what I tell them. So in my anger, I took an oath. They will never enter my place of rest. Be careful then, dear brothers and sisters. Make sure that your own hearts are not evil and unbelieving, turning you away from the living God. You must warn each other every day while it is still today so that none of you will be deceived by sin and hardened against God. For if we are faithful to the end, trusting God just as firmly as we first believed, we will share in all that belongs to Christ. Remember what it says, today when you hear his voice, don't harden your hearts as Israel did when they rebelled. And who was it who rebelled against God even though they heard his voice. Wasn't it the people Moses led out of Egypt? And who made God angry for 40 years? Wasn't it the people who sinned, whose corpses lay in the wilderness? And to whom was God speaking when he took an oath that they never would enter his rest? Wasn't it the people who disobeyed him? So we see that because of their unbelief, they were not able to enter his rest. Praise the word of God. We're going to move into a, a block of worship now, so feel free to just really go nuts. <laughs> Praise God. Well, if you're able, please stand. And let's proclaim this great salvation. And this God whose anger lasts a moment, but mercy lasts a lifetime. Praise you, Lord, for your great salvation through Jesus. Help us to turn our eyes to you now and realize all you've done, that we might live for you, that we might be changed in the light of your presence. Who, oh Lord, could save themselves?
up her eyes, lift up her eyes, you're the giver of life. Oh, we lift up her eyes, lift up her eyes, you're the giver of life. We lift up her eyes, lift up her eyes, you're the giver of life. And you alone can rescue, you alone can save, you alone can lift us from the grave. You came down to find us, let us out of death.
Father, praise the Son, praise the Spirit, three in one, God of glory, majesty, praise forever to the King of worship you Lord Jesus the one who has been declared King of Kings and Lord of Lords your greatness none can fathom you're in control of all things from beginning to end and in your name and in your person we can put our trust today Yes, Lord, thank you that we have someone who is bigger, more powerful than all earthly systems, bigger and more powerful than every temptation that we go through, bigger, more powerful than every struggle and trouble we face. We worship you. You're worthy. Worthy of every song we could ever sing Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe We live for you Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever save. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. Oh, we live for you. And holy, there is no Yeah. 
to us and in his great love for his people his great love for you demonstrated in Jesus Christ we're drawn into that love and as we experience that love we say Lord we want to build our life upon you upon what you have done what you have demonstrated to us what you the victory you've won at the cross we don't want to build our lives on sandy ground and sinking sand Lord there's so much sinking sand all around us but we want to build our life on the solid rock who is Jesus Christ our Lord the dependable one the reliable one the one who went all the way sing, I, I will build my life upon the rock. It is a firm foundation.
there is none beside you open up my eyes in wonder show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me thank you jesus amen amen really struck by the, the line in that song, open up my eyes with wonder. I just really pray that this morning, God just opens up our eyes in wonder. And not just this morning, the rest of the day, the rest of the week, um, as, as we go in and, and just interact with people. I just, I just really, I just, that, that, that line just really struck me this morning. And I just pray that that's, that, that is, um, God's heart for us this morning. So let's pray and then we'll move into a time of listening. Father God, I thank you that we can shout out your praise, sing your glory, exalt your name, because you deserve our praise and we honor you, Lord. But now we come before you and we ask that you speak to our hearts and our minds. Father God, let your spirit move in this place so we can hear the words that you want us to hear. We pray in your name. Amen. So this morning, it's very straightforward. We took the title right from the, the chapter, Jesus is Greater Than Moses. And I was chatting to my business partner because she was asking me what I was doing this weekend. And I was like, well, I've got a sermon to prepare. And she was just like, oh, how interesting. What is it that you're doing? So I told her the title. And, and I was like, I kind of feel it sort of says it all. Um, and she laughed. And what was funny, what I found really funny was that she went home and she was talking to her husband. Now, they're not Christians, um, but she went home and she was talking to her husband and clearly had sort of said that this was what I'd be, I was up to. And she came back the following day and she said her husband's response was, well, of course he's better than Moses. Moses only parted the Red Sea or parted the sea. Jesus turned water into wine, I think you know, if it's on a scale. And then, and then he was like, actually, no, hang on. Was Moses not the one with the boat? Anyway, there's something to do with water. And, and I just thought that that was really, that really just sort of lifted my, <laughs> my heart this week, just um, that conversation. But it was just really funny because for, for a good bit of our week, um, we were talking about uh, just how Jesus is greater than Moses. And it was just an obvious statement. And that's just in my workplace where I'm really the only Christian, but that was our conversation. So I just found that really encouraging this week. Anyway, God bless them for trying. Um, so it, it seems, it does seem, standing up here on a Sunday morning, um, it seems like a statement that's not going to get much argument. Um, but the thing that, that really struck me was that there would be people that would disagree with it. Um, and, and the thing that, that when, when I was thinking about my calling, um, when I, I started going into training, was one of the things that I really wanted to, to sort of, not just for my calling, but just for me personally as a Christian, was to be prepared. You know, it's all right probably growing up when I was younger, either sort of in person and in my faith, to just be like, the obvious thing is Jesus. You know, it's that sort of, the, you don't need to sort of open up the, the Bible. You know the answer. If anybody says anything, well, why does blank matter? You can just be like, Jesus, and then sort of be like, mic drop and walk away. Because it is that sort of thing that really the argument speaks for itself. Well, in my mind anyway, I, don't, I know that there's some people that I've sat down with and they're like, okay, and? Um, but I kind of just am like, 
really, if you look at it, it says it all itself. And I, I always, I feel that this is the case, but the thing for me was when I was thinking about my calling and, and thinking about what it is to sort of grow in my faith, I wanted to have better answers, fuller answers. It's, it's all right that being the, the chapter or the title of what we're looking at this morning, but being prepared and having a better answer, I think, is the key to this, to being able to explain it to somebody else, to explain it to my business partner, Jesus is greater than Moses, because he was the one that either split the sea or had the ark. We can't quite decide, but there's a better answer. There's definitely a better answer. And the thing um, that, that I found really interesting was, is that I, when I consider my friend group, um, this answer would, uh, uh, having an answer for this would actually be very important because no matter who the audience is, so I, I think for the audience for Hebrews, there would have been Jews included, there would have been Jewish converts, there would have been those who were interested, influenced by Judaism. So this, this would have mattered. And it's the same in my life. I can look at um, people who are Jewish, who are Muslims, who are in the Baha'i faith. This answer matters to them because for them, Moses is an important person. And to be able to sort of make a statement, Jesus is greater than Moses, these people in my life would want to be like, okay, but why? Um, and so that was the thing that I was thinking about this morning is that this morning really what it is is that it might seem like an obvious statement to us, but really it's one of those things that's really important for us to, to just deepen our faith, to deepen our understanding, to have a prepared answer. And I know that might sound obvious to some of you that are standing here, but really it, it was the sort of key thing that I was thinking about as I was reflecting on this verse um, that it's not just an obvious thing for us who believe, it's having a prepared answer for those around us because they're the ones that need to understand why we want to make such a big statement that Jesus is greater than Moses. Um, and so it is that thing that, 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 that may seem obvious to us, but it's important for us to be prepared. And I think that's what... I. I with all the letters or anything in the New Testament, that's really what the writer was trying to achieve, was to educate and prepare those in the church to just justify what they believe to those, maybe those around them, but maybe to a wider circle as well. Because it, I know, as I say, in my life, there's going to be people that really will disagree with me on this. So the key thing, though, for this, for us, is focus. It's how we focus our hearts and our minds. The verse says um, we should fix, it encourages us, encourages us to fix our thoughts on Jesus, whom we acknowledge as our apostle and high priest. Now, these terms should be familiar to you because we've already discussed Jesus' heart revealing um, Jesus' high priest, revealing his heart. The apostle one I, I found was that it's, it's an unusual thing to apply to Jesus because it's not a term that's really associated with him often, but it, it definitely applies because he was sent by God to us. And Jesus is worthy of all our focus. Of course, it's why we're here, it's why we sing, it's why we pray, it's why we get on our knees, because our, he is worthy of our focus. But the thing that I really loved in the passage um, was, and I'm not going to try and pronounce any of the Greek words, I'm just not going to embarrass myself, I'm sorry, um, but the, the, Greek, um, the Greek word for consider, um, in the NIV it says, fix your thoughts and this Greek word consider, it means to direct your mind carefully towards Jesus, to consider attentively. It's not just about our eyes being focused, but it's this careful consideration, attention to, our, um, to consider attentively. And I really like that because I think when I, I, when I reflect on how I focus on Jesus, I think I... I I get distracted by the having my sights set 
Um, and, and it's not that, it is that, but it's not just that. I like this, I, I like this, um, this expanse of the, the word consider. Just direct your mind carefully towards Jesus carefully. That's not haphazardly. That's not just as you're brushing on by carefully. That's with intention. That's with thoughtfulness. That's with deep consideration. That's why, again, I come back to the the statement, it's important for us to, yes, profess Jesus is greater than fill in the blank, but to consider it carefully, why we cry out these statements, why we make them And for these things, we understand that there's a purpose. When we're instructed to do something, God has a purpose for it. Jesus is our apostle, and he was the one who was sent by God, and he has told us all we need to know about God. God's plans and hopes for us were revealed through Christ. He is our high priest. And that's because that's important because what we've heard in previous weeks is how Jesus, as our as our high priest, reveals his heart, reveals his desire for us, reveals the things that we no longer have to do because Jesus does it all in his perfection as high priest. He does it all. My concluding points, because it happened to be me that was speaking on um, the high priest, my concluding points from um, what I said there was, uh, Christ's priestly role reveals his heart by giving us direct access to God, by showing us his unfailing love, and he is gentle because he knows it is the very thing we need. We fix our attention to him because we will always know comfort and safety. And if we, re- if we fixate on our own wretchedness, we will only anticipate harshness from heaven because it's all we think we deserve. And that is not the point of us focusing our eyes on Christ. And I think the important thing that came out of that for me, and then going back to it a few weeks later, Um, or a a month later, was that I am still convicted and further convicted of the importance of focusing my mind and heart on Jesus. I'm sure you're all relieved to hear that. And the writer in Hebrews knows this. The salutation in the passage as it opens tells us of the status and the desire we should have to uphold. Verse 1 says, holy brothers and sisters who share in a heavenly calling. By fixating our, our, our minds and our hearts on Jesus, who is greater than the angels and who is our apostle and our high priest, there are things that we can share in and we can only share in these heavenly callings if we focus on Jesus And we know that he is the only person that can make us holy. Holy brothers and sisters. It is a state that we want to be in, that we should desire to be in. And the only way we can do that is by focusing on Jesus. Holy brothers and sisters who share in this heavenly calling, the heavenly calling offers so much for us. There are promises that God has, plans that God has for us, and we can only receive that heavenly calling by being holy and by focusing on Jesus. It's all connected. If our focus is directed elsewhere, it detracts from this. It takes it away. And that's what this whole passage is about, is how what happens if our focus is taken away from Jesus. So thinking about buildings and builders, 
I love architecture. I really love it. Whenever we go on holiday, I'm always dragging everybody along to look at some church or some building that I want to just wander around for a couple of hours and try and find out who the architect was, why they used this thing and done that bit and done that. I love buildings. And the one that I found most recently that was just amazing was I was doing a delivery uh, up to Oban and I'd seen this thing on Instagram, this amazing looking building. Um, and it's called St. Conan's Kirk. Now, I don't know if you've heard of it or seen it. I, I was going to put up some slides, but I decided not to bother because I'd probably just get distracted by going through and pointing out all the amazing things, and that's not the point of this. So have a, a Google later on, St. Conan's Kirk, really worth it. Um, but the thing that I loved about it wasn't just the architecture itself, which was fascinating because it starts in the car park with a, a sort of old stone circle and the, the architect wanted to show the history of Christianity in Scotland going from paganism and you walk from the car park from this stone circle and you follow the path right down to the cross and how we now should be focusing our eyes on the cross. And I think that's fascinating and they've got Norman architecture, there's Celtic revival, there's Gothic, everything right on the side of a loch. You can just sit there and it's so peaceful. Honestly, it's amazing. Anyway, but the thing that's, I, I, I told you I would get distracted, um, but the thing that was wonderful is the, thing, the story behind this church. It was built by a chap who was clearly very wealthy and under mum's thumb because mum didn't want to travel to the, the church that they would go to locally. So she was like, build me a church. And he just was like, all right then, and built this church. And it's just there. It's amazing. It's such a great story. And the, archi the, 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 the guy who built it is fascinating. So the story, the the, this whole thing about the architect, uh, architecture is the story at the back of it that just makes it much more interesting. And that's the point that they're making in this passage. There is a point, I promise. Um, that's the point that they're making in this passage is that the building is wonderful, but it's the builder that deserves all the honour. The passage goes on and it emphasizes how we need to look to God as the builder, as the one who created everything. It says, he was faithful to the one who appointed him, just as Moses was faithful in all God's house. Jesus has been found worthy of greater honor than Moses, just as the builder of a house has greater honor than the house itself. For every house is built by someone, but God is the builder of everything. Moses was faithful as a servant in all God's house, bearing witness to what would be spoken by God in the future. But Christ is faithful as the son over God's house. In order to create or to build something, there requires a builder. Someone with the skill and the understanding, someone with the talent and the ability to build. And the house that's referenced in these passages is understood or can be understood to be creation. To create something like our universe requires a godlike power. And this was something Moses didn't have. But God has that power, and only God has that power. And there's a great honor to be assigned to God for being the creator of the universe. Again, very straightforward, obvious statements, but it's important. In Revelations 4.11, it says, You are worthy, O Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and by your will they were created and have their being. God created everything and deserves the honor for that creation. And similar, and similar we'll try that again, and equally... Moses didn't create the law. God used the power he had given 
uh, he, or he has, and he had gave the law to Moses. God wrote it and presented it to Moses to give to the Israelites. This God-like power was only for God. It wasn't for Moses. And Moses was a faithful servant, and he gave the law to the Israelites. But in contrast, we have Jesus, who built his church. He built a new covenant that surpasses all that came before. Through his suffering and his death and his resurrection, he fulfilled all that God wanted for us. And all that hold dear to him have access to the Father, not through the laws, not through things that Moses was able to do, the miracles he was able to perform. Jesus can do those miracles. Jesus has that God-like power. There's a distinct difference in builder and the buildings. There requires something more in order to, to have the honor and the glory and the reason for our focus. The distinction carries on between the two of them when we consider servants and sons. Um, we can see the difference between them as the imagery of the builder and the buildings continues. The writer of the passage wants to emphasize this more by, by using this imagery. Um, in Numbers 12, we've got verses 7 to 8 that says, But this is not true of my servant Moses. He is faithful in all my house. With him I speak face to face, clearly and not in riddles. He sees the form of the Lord. Why then were you not afraid to speak against my servant Moses? Moses was a faithful servant in God's house, plain and simple. Moses was seen as a sort of chief steward. It wasn't a, a lowly servant who was just doing some grunt work. He was a chief steward, so he had a role and a responsibility to, for the care of God's people. And this shows the trust that God had, has in Moses. And it says that in the passage, um, with him I speak face to face clearly and not in riddles. God would honor Moses by speaking to him clearly, would let uh, Moses see God. There was a, a, um, a position of privilege that Moses had. But there's still a hierarchy. He was still a servant, although a high and well thought of servant. But in the hierarchy of such households, the son is always higher because the son is the one that inherits. The, the son is the one that can carry out the father's um, orders and will. So the hierarchy within the household, within the building is important. Moses gave his services freely and willingly, um, but still it was a servant's position that he had. And that role was to point to something yet to come. Was As what Ian was sharing with us a couple of weeks ago, when we look at the word being all about Jesus, about the Bible pointing forward to Jesus. That was Moses' role. He didn't know it, but he was pointing towards what Jesus was going to do, for who Jesus was. It was his role. He was to proclaim future events, something, a promise for the future. So Moses had an important task to do. He was to prepare the way for the Son. And still the imagery keeps coming forward for the differences between Jesus and Moses. And not just Moses, but Aaron as well. This high priest. That imagery, we, we've been told again and again and again that Jesus is our high priest. Moses was able to, to be that servant, to be that prophet, to be that one that was proclaiming what was going to happen in the future. 
But he couldn't do the role as high priest. That had to be given to his brother Aaron. So two men had to fulfill these important roles. Where with Jesus, we have everything in one. There's a distinction there with how flawed we can be as humans. There's a difference between God-like power and what our abilities are, what we are capable of in our flesh and bone bodies. So we have to have courage and confidence. Our focus is to be trained on Jesus, God's only son, our high priest, the builder, and the Messiah. We are to be encouraged that if we hold firmly to our confidence and the hope in which we glory, we, we are his house. The New, translation, uh, the, sorry, the New Testament translation for hope is, is not quite the understanding, the same sort of understanding that we have in English. When we think of hope in English, we say, I hope you enjoyed your holiday. I hope you enjoyed that book. I hope you got my email. It's quite mild. But the New Testament word for hope gives us bragging rights, gives us confidence, gives us a boldness that we have to have. It means that the hope that we have is based on understanding that was found in facts and truth. We have a confidence around us in that hope to make a declaration and a statement that we can have confidence in, have courage in, that when we cry out, there is facts and truth that that hope is based in. It's very, very different from our understanding. If we have that hope, we get counted in God's numbers. We get counted as his house. And it links back to the opening verse. Therefore, holy brothers and sisters who share in the heavenly calling, fix your thoughts on Jesus, whom we acknowledge as our apostle and high priest. The reason for our focus is given onto Jesus is it is him who all our confidence and assurance can lie. But there's a warning. The writer quotes, the, uh, the, the writer in the passage quotes from Psalm 95, and he says, Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts, as you did in the rebellion, rebellion during the time of testing in the wilderness, where your ancestors tested and tried me, though for 40 years they saw what I did. That is why I was angry with that generation. I said, their hearts are always going astray, and they have not known my ways. So I declared an oath in my anger, they shall never enter my rest. There is a warning to us to heed the mistakes of the past, not to replicate them, not to copy what others have done before us, by straying from God, we risk ignorance. It's very similar to a child who walks away from their parent. The further they walk away, the, the harder it might be to hear what instructions you're given. Those instructions could be made out of love, out of safety. But if we're determined to keep on walking, to explore and not listening, we could get ourselves into bother. We put ourselves at risk. Don't stray from God. See to it, verse 12 says, see to it, brothers and sisters, that none of you has a sinful, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God. Verse 13, but encourage one another daily as long as it is called today so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. Encourage one another daily. 
We are to speak encouragement to each other daily, daily. I don't know about you, but I, I don't receive encouragement daily. Um, I, I speak to folk daily, but I don't receive it. And I definitely don't encourage others daily. I, I, that's probably not a great confession to make. But when I was thinking about it, this daily, encouraging daily, it, it, it really quite, quite struck me. And, and I can't think of one good reason why I don't do it. I think I just get busy with work or with other things. I, I maybe forget some, you know, I get distracted by something. But this encouragement daily is important. I want it. I want to encourage the people around me. How can we stop people from going astray, from being ignorant in God's ways? We encourage them daily. If we're left to deal with situations on our own, we don't handle it well. I don't. My mind starts to wander and I get weird ideas about, you know, how I'm coping with things or not. Usually how I'm not coping with things. I, I don't do well in handling situations on my own. I need encouragement daily. It's, it's the one thing when I, consider, when I consider my life and my calling and what brought me to where I am today, it's people who have encouraged me. I think about um, Audrey, who was my youth leader when I was at, um, at church, uh, when I was younger, and how she brought me along. She let me stay over. We'd watch videos. Her sister Elaine was the, to my dad's ever-ending, never-ending dismay, Elaine was the one that encouraged me to color my hair. Um, and as I was sat last night, I was thinking about a friend of mine from Liberton who, when he found out that I was regularly missing lunch while I was at work, was texting me daily, being like, have you had lunch? And how that actually changed a habit of mine. I have lunch. I don't have breakfast now. So, you know, swings and rounds about. But the thing is, though, the encouragement daily has helped me. It's been a positive influence on my life that I know is a good thing. Why don't we do it? Why? Now, I, I may, I'm sort of broad stroking this. You may be doing better than me and, you know, fantastic. Keep up the good work. But why aren't we doing this daily? Why aren't we encouraging each other? And it's not, I don't even think it's necessarily about sort of phoning up, you know, your friend being like, hey, just want you to know, John 3.16, love you, bye, and hang up. I think it's more than that. I think it's, it's obviously relational. It's obviously about being part of somebody's life and caring and listening to everything that's happening. But it's not being distracted. It's not letting our focus go elsewhere. I know from just even my time here at Holy Trinity, the thing that I've loved, and I said this in my review, I've loved the fact that Ian put time aside for me every week so that we could reflect and discuss. It's important to do these things. It has an impact on our lives. And if you feel that this is something that you definitely want, get in touch with the ministry team. Get in touch with your house group leader. Get in touch with somebody and just be like, I want that daily encouragement. We need to challenge each other to do that. Because today and to the very end, we need to be doing that. Verse 13 again says, but encourage one another daily as long as it is called today so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. We have come to, to share in Christ if indeed we hold our original conviction firmly to the very end as has just been said, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as you did in the rebellion. The word today is the very thing that makes it relevant for now, just as it was a thousand years ago, and just as it will be in years to come. Today, today is the very thing that sees us through to the very end. That encouragement, that focus on Christ, that desire to be in that holy state. It's not Moses, it's not angels, and it's not others in authority. It's Jesus. 
Today, if you hear his voice, obey. Today, if you hear his voice, respond with confidence, not fear. Today, if you hear his voice, tell others and encourage them. Today, if you hear his voice, rejoice. But remember this prayer as well. Lord, you have always spoken when time was ripe. And though you be silent now, today I believe. The verse finishes off with a final warning on unbelief. Verses 16 to 19 serve to round up the point that the writer has regarding Moses and the unbelief and sin that those that left Egypt had and lost faith. They didn't enter the promised land. Disobedience comes from unbelief and there's consequences. We don't like to think about those things because it's not It's not the kind of thing that you want to stand up and share, but there are consequences for unbelief. So it's important that we understand. Despite seeing many miracles in the desert, a generation of the Israelites refused to believe and they disobeyed God. Despite face-to-face contact with God, Moses still made mistakes. And he didn't follow God's command when in Numbers 20 verse 12, God tells Moses and Aaron that because they didn't follow the instructions about how to give water to the Israelites, they wouldn't go into the promised land. Despite being the greatest prophet in the Old Testament, Moses didn't make it to the promised land. There is a warning for us to not be distracted to not let our focus go elsewhere. Jesus is greater than Moses because he is not sinful. He does not doubt God's plan for us. He trusts the Father to the fullest. And that is something that we can rely on, that we can focus our hearts and our minds on. And that's why we need to carefully consider him. Let's pray. Almighty Father, we thank you that you have given us something to not just set our eyes on, but to set our hearts and our minds. You have given us Jesus. You have given us hope. You have given us confidence and boldness. We can be assured in the fact that Jesus is greater than everything. We thank you, Lord, for that hope. And I pray that it settles within our hearts and our minds this day and carries us through to the end. And Lord, if we need it, please let us encourage each other in your name. Amen. We're going to move into another song, um, but if somebody would be able to to go and let the the, the folks know that the kids can come back up, um, and we'll move into a time of worship now. And uh, ring it back, that would be great. We can, uh, we're going to sing the song, but we can stay seated and Reflect on what we've heard. Jesus, be the center. And Jesus, be the center. Be my source, be my
Good morning. Sorry, everybody, keeping you waiting. Um, yeah, we've had a great morning. I've been in chatterboxes this morning, and we've been carrying on a theme of Sermon on the Mount. Um, last week, we looked at the Beatitudes, and this week, sorry, I'm climbing up the stairs. Um, this week, we were doing about salt and light, and how Jesus has said that you are the light of the world, and you are the salt of the world. And we did some things in the dark with torches, and we did some experiments with salt just to think about what that actually looks like in our lives. Um, and that's us. Okay, excellent. <laughs> Thanks very much. Uh, a song, and the kids have all been learning about um, that you are the light of the world and you're the salt of the earth. And uh, we're going to sing a song that we do all know, uh, Let Your Light Shine. And um, we're going to do it as a band rather than on CD which is risky with this particular song. And if it all goes pear-shaped, that's fine. So let's stand together. And um, there is some actions for this if you want to join in. It goes creep, 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 and the dark fear comes to blow out all your lights. You do a big blow. <laughs> so you can try that. It doesn't want you telling everybody that Jesus rules all right. And then let your light shine. Do you want to come and help us, Laura? Let your light shine. Oh, brilliant. Give Laura a clap. She's coming up. Are we ready? I think the words are going to come up. Creep, creep, creep in the dark fear comes to blow out all your lights. It doesn't want you telling everybody that Jesus rules all right. Let your light shine, whoa, whoa, whoa. let your light shine, whoa, whoa, whoa. let your light shine and let Jesus shine through you. Giant fears are really small when all you see is God. Don't forget to stand. And give a great big shout Let your light shine whoa, whoa, whoa. Let your light shine Let your light shine 
and we're not scared. We're not scared. We're gonna let our light shine. We're gonna let our light shine. Cause Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord. And he's gonna let his light shine. Let your light shine. Whoa. of the Lord Christ go with you wherever he may send you. May he guide you through the wilderness, protect you through the storm. May he bring you home rejoicing at the wonders he has shown you. May he bring you home rejoicing once again into our doors. Amen. <laughs>